All right. Uh, all right. Well, um, I guess most people are are uh, in their correct positions. Uh, so my name is Thomas Herlin, and this is Dave Zakaria, and we'll be talking about cybernetic planning and climate change reversal. Uh, so. Uh, so basically, we're, we're, yeah, we're doing the, uh, yeah, advocating for planning, and we will get to what we mean by planning as well a little bit later. But first, uh, we thought we'd go over just, you know, the, the situation. And I found these numbers from uh, Naturvårdsverket, if I'm uh, remembering correctly. So this is current situation in Sweden. So we're emitting 60 megatons of carbon dioxide, and we're absorbing 36 million megatons of carbon dioxide per year. And this LULUCF, that's land use, land under change, and forests. So we're actually, we do sequester some carbon, primarily in land, uh, but we're still seeing a net emission, of course. Uh, but, you know, you run the numbers, you see that, okay, if we could reduce by 40% the emissions, or, you know, also increase the absorption, there's a bit of you know, a dialectical relationship, you might say. Uh, then, uh, uh, yeah, I also made this little thing. So I put in blue the absorption, and then on the, the orange uh, slice, that's what's not being absorbed, so that's the net emissions. And then the breakdown of all the industries in Sweden. Uh, yeah, we're limiting to Sweden just because, you know, it's easier. And uh, we can see that transportation and flight are... Uh, quite a big chunk of the pie. And as the previous speaker mentioned, steel and cement, that's a huge, uh, also a huge thing. Oil refineries and the other industry. Basically, transportation and industry is like 70% or so of emissions at the moment. And then you have stuff like agriculture and electricity, machinery, solvents, uh, waste, and non-central heating. Uh, and these, of course, all of these different industries affect each other. So if you, for example, like SSAB wants to go to green steel, so they do direct reduction of, of iron oxide using hydrogen, then the demand for electricity is going to increase. And unless you also have carbon-free electricity, you're kind, of, you're kind of just moving things around. You may even be worse in terms of emissions. Um, so that's something that we're... Um, looking at. So basically our point is that the climate situation requires us to physically, you know, take the carbon out of the atmosphere and put it into the ground. And our point is that the market will be unable to do this since it considers carbon dioxide to be, a, you know, an externality. And our point is also that this will require very large scale investments. There will be a need to develop new industry uh, or new new technical you know solutions and stuff, and because of this uh, planning and especially worker participation in this planning is essential. So you, you cannot even have like a you can't have like a single little panel of people deciding this. But you need to have the people who have the actual knowledge of the electricity grid of how the food is made and all this stuff uh, need to be involved in this process. So. Uh, we also have a little bit of basically where this notion of planning comes from. And of course, we have uh, some stuff from, from Marx. So uh, this is a quote from Capital. So let us now picture to ourselves by way of change a community of free individuals carrying out their work with the means of production in common. Labor time would, in that case, play a double part. Its apportionment in accordance with a definite social plan maintains the proper proportion between the different kinds of work to be done and the various ones of the community. So Marx is a little bit, he's not very explicit in a lot of his work. Uh, I think the most explicit he gets is in the Gotha critique. Uh, you also have Engels with uh, socialism, utopian and scientific, but neither of them are really, they, this is kind of the closest I found uh, looking at it. So they kind of identify that you need to look at, at the use values. Uh, but the exact details, so in the 1860s, it is believed that this is kind of just an, an internal accounting problem and it's not particularly difficult. 
but it turns out to actually be rather rather tricky. And then from the talk yesterday, uh, was it Ben Benenov uh, brought up Otto Neurath. And uh, Neurath was an Austrian Marxist, and he advocated for total socialization. And this via what's called in-kind calculation. So it's basically calculating in terms of use values uh, in order to coordinate production. And uh, the reason for this is partly because he worked at the Department of War Economy in the Austro-Hungarian Army. Uh, so during the, the First World War, the, the Austro-Hungary pretty much immediately went to planning for the war economy. Uh, because basically what no Neurath says is that you win wars with you know, bread and bullets and bombs and not with money. And they actually realized this and they, they made the best of the situation. They still lost the war, of course, but uh, they did pretty well for a landlocked country surrounded by mostly by enemies. You know. uh, and he was also involved in the Bavarian uh, Soviet Republic, which was a short-lived uh, socialist project in, in Bavaria that lasted for less than a month before the authorities went and shut it down and arrested all the involved. Uh, Neurath somehow managed to avoid, uh, avoid them. And he fo formulated what's called the Kranold Neurath Schumann plan, which was, which was basically a plan to fully socialize Bavaria. But of course, this didn't really come to pass. Um, so it's kind of the 1910s. And then in 1921, we of course get uh, the most famous example of planning, I would guess. We get Gosplan in the USSR. And Gosplan em emerges as a way to deal with the problems uh, that they encountered during Goelro, the attempt to basically the, the, the electrification of the Soviet economy called for this. Uh, massive plan and they quickly discovered that this was rather rather tricky and rather tedious uh, so basically yeah Gosplan is founded in this uh, yeah at this time and they mostly concerned themselves with strategic planning so a few key goods were planned in kind so things like steel and I believe electricity of course uh, transportation in terms of kilometer tons, that kind of stuff. But other than that, they usually for, for a lot of the light industry, they just went with rubles. So they, they couldn't really do the, the sort of detailed uh, low level planning, but rather a more uh, upper. And yeah, they, 1921, there's no computers or computer is a title that someone holds. It's a job. Uh, so they have pen and paper and adding machines. That's kind of the technology they have in 1921. Uh, but they did move towards computerization after a while. And I believe they also had some kind of proto-internet. There are some uh, stuff like this. It's, it's tricky to get hold of details because the details are in Russian. So if anyone has details translated, then we are interested in, the, interested in that. Um, so that's how they did it in the USSR. It's kind of bureaucratic as well, as we may all know. Uh, the second, probably less famous example, but a lot of people probably know about, is Project Cybersyn in Allende, Chile. Uh, and this came about, I believe it's Fernando Flores who was responsible for basically socializing the Chilean economy. And he brought in a British like management consultant kind of guy called Stafford Beer. And his model is known as the viable system model, which is kind of a multi-tiered uh, kind of, let's, let's say kind of a multi-tiered planning where you, you want to push everything as local as possible. And you, you only want, for example, each workplace to notify the, the level above if there's a problem. So um, if everything is working as it should, then you keep it sort of local, and only when there's an issue do you bring in, you know, maybe the regional people or yeah, so up, up, up the chain. And this meant that they were capable of both tactical and strategic planning. So the system was able to adapt to changing uh, conditions, and especially 
Uh, this was especially useful. They had a big like bourgeois, like a reactionary transportation strike uh, in, I believe, 72, something like this. And they, using this system, they were able to sort of plan around it to, to direct the transportation that they did have uh, sort of socialized around the, the strike. And this thing was network from pretty much day one. Uh, though this was kind of a primitive network, it uses what's called a teletype system, which is sort of an early, early thing. And also partly computerized. They didn't have too many computers. They had maybe three or so. Yeah, two, okay. Uh, but yeah, it was an interesting experiment. Unfortunately, after the Pinochet coup, they you know, tore it all down. So that's how that goes. Uh, and then finally, which some people here may be aware, since the 90s, we have especially uh, this book by Paul Cockshot and Alan Cottrell called, called Towards a New Socialism, where they talk about using, for example, linear programming to do planning, uh, making use of our, uh, the massive advances in modern computing, and especially like a, a radical vision for democracy based on the Athenian uh, democracy. So it uses sortition. So basically, you draw representatives by lot. So you know, among the entire population, you yeah, pick randomly, pretty much, and you will sort of automatically uh, <laughs> represent the people. And via this, we could say that we're kind of seeing a, a cybernetic socialism emerging, which is based on these, this thought of, of computerization, of radical democracy, and of kind of um, automating, like the drudgery of planning can be automated and also democratized by sort of giving people direct access to it. So if you, if you can access the planning system over the internet, you have made a huge stride compared to previous uh, efforts. So I will leave this to Dave here. <clears throat> All right, so some of you may be familiar with what cybernetics is. It sounds very futuristic, but actually it's a pretty old idea. Probably goes back, to, well, it goes back to the 1940s. Um, basically, it's the study of systems that steer in an uncertain environment using feedback. So uh, it really has to do with you know, steering the rudder, looking at where you're heading, and adapting your, your steer signal accordingly. And things are ever-changing, like in the real world, but you're, you're basically adapting your, your, your control. So, and this sort of branched out into many um, actual disciplines later. But if you go back to the, some of the founding fathers, it's Norbert Wiener and, and, and probably, you could argue, maybe Claude Shannon also. <clears throat> so it's actually an old idea. And, and they had many, this period had a lot of sort of visionary things. It grew out, out of uh, the efforts during World War II, had center in the United States, but actually well, it was um, denounced as a bourgeois deviation in, in uh, the Soviet Union, but then later caught on and was rehabilitated in, within uh, parts of the Soviet Union. Although it never became, let's say, the dominant way in which uh, economic planning was considered. <clears throat> now, within capitalism, you can actually think of many different degrees of coordination that, that, um, that has occurred throughout history. I mean, you have households, uh, you know, it's a few individuals at, at most, and um, at the other extreme, you have the wartime economy, as the North example shows, where you have basically you have to consider all not just the direct amount of let's say tanks or food you want to produce, but all the indirect links. I mean that's what makes things very complicated that you have indirect uh, links between all the units of production. And um, market economies obviously are more on the the local side. That is the degrees of freedom. Basically, suppliers and users talk to their buyers and sellers, and that's the they don't consider all the end products for which. You know, you improve green steel locally, but as Tomas said, where's the end? Uh, what's the net result in the end? That's not obvious from a producer's point of view. So <clears throat> they have this inherent flaw in that they, they, in terms of climate change, is that they, they don't really look at the, let's say, end to end from, from target to final output. And so climate change reversal, if you really want to uh, steer the economy towards it requires this high degree of coordination. I think coordination is probably the, the better way to uh, art formulate the challenge of, of climate change rather than the classical, um, a bit confused plan versus market distinction. Uh, you start, I think, the, 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 you just start at the end goal and see how do you achieve it. I mean, hypothetically, markets could do it, but there's, what we're arguing is that there's very little evidence that you can actually account for all this uh, 
um, effects of climate uh, impact. And there is actually, I think Matt Huber mentioned before, but uh, anyway, there's been effort, uh, estimates on how much effort it would take to actually change or reverse the climate change trend. And it's, the current estimates are you know, a larger labor effort than the war effort in World War II. So it's a very massive project to even begin. And arguably, you could even make the case that uh, it would require even higher degrees of free, uh, coordination than a wartime economy, because there was a national and uh, climate change reversal will be international if it's actually done on a global scale, and it's a global problem. So, now this is just to illustrate how you know how indirect things affect. I mean, if you look at uh, end consumption, like let's reduce the amount of steak we're eating or whatever, you know, as uh, Matt, uh, Huber said before, uh, you know, all these indirect links is really where things matter, and uh, that's what planning is trying to get at. That it's trying to take into account this whole all the indirect effects. <laughs> But now the point is we have explicit constraints, not in terms of like how many tanks you need to produce, but actually uh, capping the amount of uh, net emissions, um, in this case mainly greenhouse gas. And you can al already see that you know, things have to be accounted for then in actual, well, units of carbon uh, dioxide, for instance, not number of dollars. It doesn't really help you if, if the dollars go down or up, uh, or if the carbon emissions keep increasing. So you have to do things in physical rather than monetary terms. And then we're back to the arguments of Neurath, which was, who was making this point. Now, it's somewhat different than, than the previous context, you know, maybe the war economy and all. Here, here the targets would be set in part by climate change models. You know, over a time horizon over 30 years, uh, we need to uh, cap this. I mean, the model will tell you roughly how much carbon emissions you have to reduce per year. And then work yourself backwards and say, how should we scale back production accordingly? <clears throat> So you can see how this is, you know, interfaces with the, class, or the old ideas of cybernetics, steering your economy, a massive complex system, towards some sort of overall objective set by the citizenry. And this is one way to sort of visualize it. I mean, there are many ways in which you can do this. This, goes, this is a way you do in control, uh, sort of, um, well, cybernetics did it. It's the idea of feedback loops. So you have to think of a society in which you have sort of an economic commune. Now this could be of any scale. You can even think sub-national, let's say in region Stockholm level. You could go national or supranational. The idea we, we, we're uh, discussing here is in a sense scale invariant as long as you have large numbers of units of production. You have to start somewhere. There will be never a global revolution then, then so to speak, planning begins. It's always going to start at some scale that's sub-national, uh, sub-global, let's say. Right, so you have a lot of units of production, uh, that is to say, um, a lot of de facto firms, people working at workplaces, uh, producing things. Now comes the type of things we were discussing before, like we want certain type of housing, uh, mass transit, these many wind turbines. Those are final targets in this very complex mesh of firms or production units. How are we supposed to scale and who, which units of production should ramp up their production? Who should be scaled back? How should we steer the labor into different firms or workplaces how should we, uh, over time so that we produce these many houses, these many wind turbines? That's those massive scale things. And you have to take into account all the indirect effects of producing wind turbines, not just the local production of wind turbines at the local wind turbine factory. It's all the you know, steel and all the whole process. That's at one end. But then you have the, the consumer type input. I mean, how many packets of milk do we need tomorrow or next week? That has to also be taken into account, uh, as, not as someone specifying it, but basically recording what's happening at the local shops. I mean, you need to maintain a certain level of uh, basic consumption, whatever that is. Uh, and this goes back to the talk that some of you maybe uh, attended Beninov's talk yesterday. He was discussing, but we'll get back to this issue of who sets the targets. <clears throat> Then you get to a sort of technical aspect. I mean, this whole question of w which parts of the economy should ramp up and we should be scaled back, who should, uh, how should you allocate labor and resources? So that's the sort of technical aspect, which we will not go on into here, but that's a question of optimization. What's a rational uh, reallocation? But then you come to a critical part where you could argue that the, the cybernetic insights were, uh, were not there in, let's say, the previous experiments, namely, you can plan for what you know right now and try to optimize as best as you can. But how do you know about future technologies, and the future recipes by which you produce things that you have no idea about? You cannot plan for it. You need to allocate a certain portion of your economy to say, go explore. It's the equivalent of R&D. 
uh, where you try out new things and evaluate them in terms of, let's say, carbon emission in the total sense. So people have to try out things, and that's why you need this, not just workers implementing and uh, work, going to work and doing their regular jobs, but actually a portion of which of their labor time is actually dedicated to trying out new things and seeing what works and evaluating it based on this optimization type idea. So this feedback is really, really essential. I mean, it's just like a, the picture of the sailing boat. I mean, if you're just blindfolded, there's no feedback. You're just hopefully steering towards the end goal. You need to correct your path continuously as you're proceeding in the uncertain environment. And that really should be like institutional. It should be institutionalized, this idea of feedback. Um, and that's the, I argue, the hardest part here. And this is where we need a lot of intellectual resources to think through possible coordination protocols. How do you specify goals? How do you induce people to implement them? And how do they feed back information? So what are the incentive structures? Things that usually, um, I would say, maybe socialists have neg neglected largely. <clears throat> this is very important. There's no way around this thing. You have to incentivize in different ways people to do things. All right, so um, this is the overall picture in which um, planning takes place. And you may wonder, where is the planning then? Well, in this case, planning is basically recommending different units of production to scale up or scale down. Like, oh, in, over the next coming months, you should, not, you should ramp up production. You, you people should be scaling down. Now, the, there's a lot of open issues there. How do you transfer labor from one sector to another? I mean, how do you incentivize people to move over the coming two years? It's not, I mean, it's not unheard of. This is what happened in Sweden when you moved from large parts of one region of the country to another by uh, the wage compression policy. But um, it, re re it requires serious thought. Um, <clears throat> right, so planning actually here is in terms of, let's say, recommendations. And then these uh, units of production, whatever they are, if they're local scale things or mass factories, they will have to try out, implement, and feedback. Is this sort of idea clear, the rough sort of intention here? All right. All right, so then there are actually many ways. I mean, there are many different uh, uh, ways in which you could say you ramp up milk production, reduce this thing. So what is a, what is it, which plan should we pick, basically, and what's an efficient plan? And this goes back to the talk yesterday uh, by Aaron Benenow, namely, there are always going to be, there's never going to be one criteria by which you can just order the best plan. There's always going to be multiple criteria, multiple social, uh, social objectives, and they are often conflicting. And here just, this is a nice way to sort of uh, summarize this problem. Let, let's suppose that you want to minimize the carbon emission. You push it down as far as you can to this end. Well, you'll push your standard of living down to zero as well. And, you know, it's a bit like that thing, you shouldn't have kids, well, should we have humanity then? Should we just, I mean, you can produce everything, you can, you can solve climate change by removing humanity, but that's not really, um, that's not a socialist aspiration. And conversely, you could reduce the, I mean, you could reduce the working week as well, and, and in that sense, affect climate change uh, positively, but you'll also reduce your standard of living. So there's going to be always conflicting objectives. This is just the nature of, I mean, in fact, the nature of economics is precisely this. Uh, how do you allocate, re allocate resources subject to constraints? Um, <clears throat> so among these possibilities, there are they're basically, if you set a, a, a constraint that we should not emit more than this, and the working week should not be more than 40 hours or 35 hours, then what's the resulting living standard, for instance, or vice versa? You set up constraints and see what is possible in, within this set of constraints. <clears throat> now, um, you can't, you can't get it all, so to speak. You have to compromise on something. And you know, some of the, us were we more or less willing to compromise on some mm -hmm. of the things. We'll have conflicting interests on, you know, some people want to work longer and get better uh, standard, oh, material standard of living and so on. This will be a process of political contestation and, and uh, just built into the system. But one thing that actually changes this, and this is um, something that uh, Aaron Bannanov, they, they touched upon in the end, is, is you know, you could actually alleviate this di dilemma over, over time. Um, namely, the classic idea of improving the productive capacities. I mean, in Marxist jargon, that's uh, expanding the productive forces. Suddenly, this trade-off is less tight. You can work shorter hours and still maintain the living standard or reduce more carbon and still remain. So you really have to find more efficient techniques and this goes back to that thing of letting workers or workplaces explore. They need to find these more efficient techniques. You can't plan for it. 
So uh, really, uh, and unlike, uh, you know, the, you have to incentivize the structure in, in the planning process. Uh, and unlike in market-based uh, or capitalist economies, searching these efficient techniques are no longer guided by rate of return or profitability. They must be evaluated by that end efficiency that human beings are, have uh, set up. Namely, let's say we want to minimize labor hours or uh, carbon emissions. And then they should be incentivized accordingly. Those that come up with the more efficient technologies should be able to ramp up more or get more benefits in some way or some way of uh, incentivizing this change. <clears throat> so uh, this is the sort of feedback aspect that's really, really important over time. Um, but then, of course, which plan should you pick? Uh, and in fact, you could argue in some countries it's precisely the first one, namely the, the material living standard is abysmally low, so we really have to ramp up just basic goods and services. But um, in advanced countries, you could argue that this is, this is not at all the goal anymore. In fact, uh, very rapidly you find when people, at least on individual level, they could uh, get lo longer vacations and all, they would prefer that. And you know, historically, this is the, the, the third type of objective is precisely the, 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 what the labor movement was focused on for very long um, and abandoned in the, the later part of the 20th century. Um, but that, is, that would be, if you go back here, it would be, oh, maybe here, it would be to press the, living, the working week as short as you can, the global working week. And then how that's allocated, that's, again, a question of um, protocol design. How do you allocate labor in the population? And this is a very important open problem. Um, all right, so, uh, and yeah, we can get back to this. So the, this is, in common to Aaron Berenow's talk, he actually made the point that yes, there's, he made the first point, namely there are multiple objectives and they're always conflicting or potentially conflicting. We agree with that. He then said that there, there can, there, you can never trade these off. I mean, that's formally incorrect. The moment you can quantify any of these objectives, you can trade them off. And in fact, we're doing them all the time. They could be more or less coherent how you're trading them off, but you are trading them off. Uh, and that, these basic constraints basically are illustration of that idea. Um, I mean, basically, when you pick, let's say, minimize labor, labor time, then you are saying, how much am I prepared to reduce my standard living up to whatever constraints I set? All right, so let's uh, round off there. I guess there's uh, the, the classic question to end on. What is to be done? There's a lot to be done, I think. Uh, not just like over a long period of actually tackling this problem, but even at this level, building up uh, capacities within the broader left and let's say environmental movement. Um, I mean, what should socialists do? Uh, arguably, we have no e independent economic theory. We, all left intellectuals, LO economists, uh, the bulk of uh, you know, economic expertise build on theories and frameworks that are um, basically not far from conventional economics, for which you just add and you hope that you're adding something that represents um, environmental constraints. There's nothing like in-kind planning. There's nothing like these kind of cybernetic thinking, uh, um, large-scale uh, reallocation problems. So we have no independent theory. We, if you want, there is a rich literature on this, but they're not what you, if you go to economics courses in, or, uh, at Stockholm University or anywhere else, you're not gonna, you have to learn by yourself. You have to study it outside the, main, the mainstream. Uh, so we, we have, in a broader sense, we have to build up this economic theory and policy independently and think about them quite seriously. I think they've been brushed aside for very long. Uh, at least in the West. Now, re countries that actually face these things, they had to think hard about it because their future were at stake. Another thing is we need to popularize and disseminate these alternatives. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, our uh, political imagination is very limited. We, it's very hard to think about beyond any, anything that may be some sort of, well, Green New Deal is basically the most visionary thing we have at, at the moment, which is eff effectively incentivized uh, uh, in ways to incentivize private investments. Right? There's no fundamental change of anything else. And hopefully that could steer you in a certain way, but it's not even the scale you need for, for these pro problems. And then there's you know, the run, which is really a critical point. You, you cannot deploy to such a system just out of nothing. You have to start trying out uh, 
seeing the failures or, or correctives, redesign, look at, ex you need to evaluate just like the feedback loop itself. And we have not such experiments. We could do it on a certain scale if you had sort of more visionary uh, projects. I mean, you could do it within parts of the public sector and see how with internally, I mean, you have internal accounting in many of these uh, public sectors. You don't have to buy between or sell between units of production. You could actually have a, a virtual, uh, you know, allocation of, of, of goods. Uh, in, in other countries, like in Spain, we, know we have sort of comrades who are, who are approaching Mondragon, which is the biggest uh, cooperative in the world. And um, our good problem in Brazil, there are, you know, there are local producers who would, who would probably benefit being stronger together. That's the thing. Uh, that's the potential of this kind of uh, framework of thinking. Um, and we sort of set up, those of you who are sort of, uh, know some basic programming, we set up some experimental code and sort of a white paper describing how some of these te techniques could work. Uh, work with uh, Luke, who is here. Um, we're using real Swedish data for national accounts. There is actually multi-sector, like uh, forestry, steel sector, blah, 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 the whole table of what's being produced and consumed. How should you allocate to meet targets there? It's still very coarse, but it allows us to actually at least take a first step towards imagining what it would be to steer the economy in some direction. All right, uh, I think that's about it. So. Any questions? That's all again. That's money. That's somewhere there. Yeah. Yeah. So there has been an argument that I think the book was called The Papers are Up for All Months. Yeah. That the history of planning has advanced between the private sector and the private sector. And also, uh, if you remember that Stafford beer was making a living one of the members of the university, so she applied the theories of cybernetic planning uh, uh, organization within uh, big corporations. Uh, is there something that the socialist movement can learn uh, from the advancements in planning of the community? They don't go with anything, don't go with anything like that. But they somehow need to go to very long supplies. Right. So there has, so there are practicalities which have been resolved in the practice. What can be learned there? Well, I, I think at least in logistics, there's massive advancements beyond what, what we presented, and, and incorporating such logistical constraints. Um, uh, delivering in time and so on. I think that aspect, there's a lot to be learned. Of course, we, I, I don't think I have uh, even near the sufficient knowledge. But the rest, also, a lot of management, management literature is, you know, it's bullshit. Right? It's, it's done from the point of view of a manager. So it's, this worker participation, actually exploration, allowing for that, it's much less of that aspect. Um, but I, I, yeah, there is valuable insights to be there, but we need, it's, I guess it's part of this, building up our capacities to work out just through that literature and extracting what's useful. You also get a bit of a difference when, since the, these firms want to maximize profit, but if we pick, for example, minimizing the working week, these will be, you know, result in very, very different ways of doing things. Because uh, the motivation is very, very, the incentives are very, very different. So, hopefully. <laughs> uh, I think yeah. was precise in my question. Oh. Okay. Uh, so? I know that uh, people at Statistics Sweden, if, if, when they are trying to do better environmental statistics, green GDP, etc., they have tr began to use this, uh, what that was talked about yesterday in the, the, the Mane uh, presentation about uh, this production recipes. Uh, and uh, so uh, I don't know if you have heard of that, but uh, there may be some uh, knowledge already collected on that things that, for example, can be used at least in modeling or uh, trying to forecast things. 
I, yeah, I mean, I can just mention, we, we discussed this yesterday, this thing about production recipes basically would be that every, uh, let's say it's a firm producing milk packets, uh, whatever it is, they would have alternative ways of doing it. Now, the, the problem is you can't really specify that. What you can say is what we did now and possibly what we did in the past. How you in the future could produce milk packets more efficiently, that's in a sense, um, while you could possibly parameterize it, you can't tell what it is. Uh, and that is part of that exploration that, that local units have to try out. Yeah. And uh, perhaps you should yeah. say that it, it can be quantified, but we can't know what it, uh, we need the input of the workers. So the workers will know how to make like a milk packet of different types. So they need themselves need to put it in because you can't have like, you know, you can't have your central committee sitting around, <laughs> you know, dreaming up production methods. It has to be the workers themselves because they are the ones with the knowledge. Unless the farmers have only proposed it in the same spirit as this example from Walmart, you can learn something from it, not that you could have a total solution. Or I agree with what you say. Of course, you need to work it exactly. So if you actually, if those were interested in the formal side of it, you could actually think of setting up like this code allows you to set up a hypothetical alternative production mix and see what would that do for carbon emissions to in total in Sweden. Like let's suppose you could produce steel in a different way. I can try out what the inputs could look like and what would, it, what would be the net result. Um, but uh, in the end that has to be anchored in real data. You can, you can play around with it, but someone has to try it out in real. <coughs> Oh. Uh, do you see any pathways that don't that are predicated on like states and state like that? Like does this have to be top down in your mind? Not really. Like uh we should have had a slide on the VSM, but basically uh, it is beneficial to push it as local as possible because information travels more easily, you know, locally. But at the same time, you know, it, you you will need some form of global uh, coordination because you will, for example, uh, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere is a global concern. So therefore, for you will need a global politics as well. But generally, we kind of for very practical reasons, you want to push it as local as possible. But again, this, isn't, this is government, not state. So as Marxists, we should recognize that there's a difference between the government and the state uh, and you know, the political structure. So, um, but yeah, we, we generally, we want to kind of people, when you say planning, people tend to think that you want to like recreate Gosplan. And, you know, and they also have like incorrect views of what Gosplan even was. So people will think that like, like Stalin sits in his office and like decides you should make this many tanks and you should make this many of that. But that's not really the case. It's more of a, even in the Soviet Union, in, even with the problems they had, it was still kind of semi-participatory. It was kind of limited to, to um, workplace managers, I believe, which is kind of where you know, that has its own class dynamics. But uh, yeah, we're, we're very much in, in favor of trying to sort of, yeah, I don't know, get worker participation into this. Um, and it's also, yeah, it, there are many reasons why, but. Uh, oh, but your, your question actually has two dimensions. The one's a legal one, I mean, what's the legal form of the economic commune? And uh, I think there, there are multiple ones that are compatible with this. The problem, I think, the deeper problem is this co question of the design of coordination protocols. How do you incentivize, how do you punish uh, or uh, dis disincentivize uh, economic units that do not adhere to the plan? These are the real hard questions. Legal form is a bit, uh, you know, a bit a derivative of that. You must first think about the coordination aspect of it. And at some point, you know, you have to, it includes, for instance, let's suppose the citizens decide that we want to build a, a you know, mass transit. You know, um, at some point, who's going to enforce this thing actually going through? So you, you would have at some point something equivalent to a legal system to make sure it actually happens. Um, but uh, these, are, these are exactly the questions we, we should develop capacities to, to be able to answer, or at least say this is a model for which you could try out. I could say that I, there is a text called uh, Anarchist Cybernetics, which has been brought up by, by uh, General Intellect Unit has an episode on this. So it's not, I actually talk to the local kind of syndicalist types, like you should look at this stuff, because 
you know, all ideas are, are good in my view anyway. So, uh, but yeah. Hmm. More questions? Or any point you want to make? Usually there's always a yeah. good one. Uh, maybe a naive question, but how do you conceive of money in this scheme? Money at all present or any other kind of tokens? Or are we way past that? It, it's easier if you don't have to care about remuneration. So that, that's what's called the remuneration problem, or what I, or we call the remuneration problem. And you can add, on top of this, you could add a system of labor vouchers, for example. And you can relatively, it's straightforward to compute the, uh, the value of every good produced. This is a straightforward mathematical operation. You have the, the labor statistics, you know, you, have, you know how many shifts people have worked, you know how much they put out. Uh, in terms of you know number of you know glass carafes, number of microphones, and you can just account for this, and you can you can put a value, a price tag, if you want, and then you can sort of there's a political struggle there whether, for example, should we price? Uh, we could decide to put a price on uh, like hospital care if we wanted to, but probably wouldn't. But you know you can compute what the what the value of a certain service or good is and then you can decide whether this should be provided you know free free of uh, free of cost uh, I mean, it's like a decision between public provision versus market provision essentially it's the same type of thing so conversely you could say you know instead of uh, you freely choosing how much milk you had you could say this much ration it's it's a, it's a this you know everyone gets this much milk so it's a question of think the citizen should decide what are the public common goods and what are not but the consumer goods arguably should be allocated in some sort of token or credit based system and then some parts should be tied to remuneration for the very at least for some sort of basic incentive structure you, you could for example provide like certain kind of basic housing basic food and stuff for free but say beer you might require a payment for so no, no beer unless you work but you will be given potatoes <laughs> Yes, as a short follow-up, so, so this is not really market socialism in that sense. No. Market. You, you Incentivizing structure. No, you could have a... So in uh, Cockshot and Cockrell's book, they, they suggest a system of publicly run stores where the local, the people who run the store locally can kind of adjust the prices a little bit, uh, basically to get rid of old stock. Uh, but the, it would be more on the level of the firm. Like, for example, consider if, if we, you, you and your friends have an idea to make a better microphone or something, and you could kind of request resources from the system to do this, and then you kind of, you know, you make a, you have a pilot project, and you put out a bunch of, of these new microphones and see if people want them. And if they want them, the system will notice this, and it's like, oh, well, have more resources and the other way around the people making the old microphones will suddenly see their allocations decrease um, and then there is a question of should you adjust the, the remuneration for the, how should the remuneration work should there be peace wages in the system should there be a basic income should there be a, an hourly wage? Should there be a combination of these things? So that's a, and that's again a political question that we we kind of you know. To the others. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it's not market socialism in the sense that there's no uh, at no point in the in the system is it are signals being governed by um, rate of return on investment. Uh, there are other criteria for which you are incentivizing. So in one sense, I mean, uh, the reason we put this, well, let me just go back to this point here, planning and being, this and being essential is that this is, you know, the central planning dimension and this is sort of the market socialist dimension, if you like. And uh, actually in formal literature and like contextual bandits and so on literature, this is known as exploitation, namely go, go opportunistic on the best method you know about. And the other one's known as exploration, namely search for better methods. And that's why you need both elements, and it's a question of how much you want to spend on one or the other. Hmm. Yes? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask if you have any ideas of like, if this is systematically implemented on whatever level, how would it play with the surrounding environment of a capitalist world? Well, at some point, you reach the end of, of what's inside the system, and, and hmm. 
Yes, it would unavoidably, unavoidably you have to do trade. So trade would be a sector, kind of in the, kind of a unit in the system. And there, that's kind of, depending on the scale of the system, you can start doing very fancy, like you, you, the entire system internally is entirely transparent. So you could like notice on the market that the, the price of this, of some good, is way lower than its value. And then the system could exploit this in order to you know, get foreign currency cheaply into the thing. And then it could, you know, that's another, it's a good, same as any other. You know, uh, money in the system is just another, you know, thing you have uh, available. And sometimes you need to buy things. Um, so you, you kind of have to maintain a certain level of credit and, uh, you know, a trade balance that kind of doesn't deviate too much. Uh, but you can have, using the planning system, it can figure out a way to basically suck value out of the capitalist economy. So if it's set up correctly, and that, that's at least why I say that socialism necessarily is a higher mode of production. And so a, a successful socialist system will eat capitalism because it is more rational. Uh, so, but that's, yes, it would, you would have to do trade. You couldn't like do like North Korea. <laughs> oh, uh, even they do trade, so. Uh. Well, let's take the example of wind turbines, so that the citizenry decides in this commune to expand it. You're going to have to import parts of it. This, you can't do this internally. Uh, so, I mean, the, the model is actually formally premised on being uh, embedded in an environment that's possibly hostile, and that you have to tra interact with. Uh, what you, what the, one of the things you can leverage is the drive towards efficiency, rather than rate of return, so maybe you can get benefits that way. But uh, you really have to start leveraging economies of scale in trade, for instance. I mean, this is a bit like Sustain Bulag being large and being able to purchase in, at, at uh, in large units. Then smaller units can benefit being part of this cooperative or com commune. So there must be a dimension of that where uh, you can punch, each individual can punch above its weight when it has uh, organized into a commune. But uh, I think it's a big challenge. I mean, if there's, if the, the economic environment, the political environment is such of blockades, then you really have to like the, the accordingly this must adapt to the constraints that you have in trade balance. But uh, that's really, ch uh, I mean, you're really on stormy waters to take this example then. <coughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that would be a demand constraint. So you would need to produce, for example, gluten-free products. And you know, you put in a, you know that some number of people want them and you produce them. Like there's a lot of stuff you can do with just thinking in terms of constraints. So even things like, you know, we, we don't want to build factories in a certain area because of cultural reasons or whatever, and put that into the system and it'll, you know, avoid that. So there's a lot of stuff you can do. Like we mentioned carbon dioxide, for example, to take the, the uh, from the person there. Uh, there's other environmental constraints you could put in as well, of course. Uh, I think your question uh, touches upon in what I think is a fundamental political dynamic in a socialist economy, namely the tension between, let's say, the community and the individual, whatever it is you pick. So I think this is just uh, this is how political life looks like in a socialist economy. It is between what you're trying to articulate being the community's interests and local, let's say, interests. And that, in that sense, politics lives on. It just takes other forms. But you will always have this contestation of, of interests just by nature of being human beings. It's unavoidable. I mean, it's, uh, you could argue that in the gluten example, you could exclude the gluten minority. <laughs> yeah, that could happen. But the, you know, that's political struggle in that case for that minority to, to actually win, you know, make his voice heard. And when they win, they, they'll get the part of that saying, you know, we have to allocate a certain part of production for this, gluten being a bit 
silly example, but I don't think it's a huge problem. But you could imagine other struggles. Yeah, I mean, uh, in terms of production, that is the. I mean, I mean, more realistically, you have in Sweden right now, you know, the fight over wind turbines. But I mean, that is actually going on. It just takes the form of you know parliamentary struggle and and so on. But this would be live in a socialist economy as well. Uh, what kind of? Uh, I mean, if you re have to revamp your your energy system, some people lose out. And the community may gain. So how do you take that into account? That doesn't have to be part of the political struggle and the this question of coordination protocols. But now it's done. I mean, here at least in principle, it's uh, you know one person, one vote. In the current system, it's not. So, I mean, this is the way democracy works if it were to be real. <coughs> Uh, now we have a. I have a slide prepared for this. Uh, on <laughs> Finally. The, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I put a. I put a, at least on the computational side. Basically, uh, for optimizing it, if we do linear programming or linear pl planning, where we presume that there's no economics of scale or anything, which is a simplifying assumption. Basically. It has the same complexity as solving a linear system. And it turns out because each workplace only takes inputs from a limited number of other workplaces, uh, the number of uh, the current estimate is 160 different inputs on average to you know, any workplace. Uh, it turns out that it's actually, uh, well, basically, it's, it's a lot simpler than the Austrians would have you believe. So the, the you know, uh, Mises and Hayek and those guys completely, you know, uh, their arguments are completely null by modern advances in computing. And experiments that I've done and then reading in the literature, the, the uh, indication is that it takes less than 10,000 uh, matrix vector multiplications. And if anyone you know, has done high performance computing, we know that this is a, you know, it's a very nice place to be. It's, it's not going to take years and years to reformulate the plan based on changing conditions. You can just kind of you know, move a constraint, resolve the system in a couple of hours, and then, which means you can start asking questions like, what happens if we add a new production method? What, how does that affect things? And you can get an answer in a reasonable time. So there, there's a, it's a lot easier now than it was, you know, where, when Chile tried to do this, for example. I mean, your basic uh, question, whether it's been solved, is that in a sense we don't know. The, the computational things appear now sca uh, uh, scalable. I mean, it seems like many of the computational questions are resolved. So that aspect of the calculation debate is gone. Uh, but the computational infrastructure and all these other things around it, that's a bit of an open question, how much you can do in real time and so on. But uh, I think still the fundamental problems are, are this coordination protocol. So we have much less understanding there than we have about computational procedures, because that's so much more formalized. And we actually have robust theory now that they didn't have in the calculation debate. So uh, we, have an, we have advanced on one, but we really not have moved much on the other one. You mean like cryptocurrency? They are very using all these principles of cybernetics and incentives and, you know, that what you mentioned, maybe like so even market socialism. Um, what do you, I mean, do you have any thoughts about the way it's been used already by the right to do experiments with this plan on smaller scales? Well, they're still in. They're still doing market stuff, so it's still subject to the chaos of the market. So, they, you know, they're not going to be able to deliver any kind of guarantees on climate stuff. Uh, because you know. they have these mechanisms like regenerative events, you know, that use these principles of cybernetics to, you know, sell credits and sequester carbon, and but their whole feedback system is, I mean, is different inputs, but. Kind of a, you know, imaginary and, and, and or theory of 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, you can pick ideas from cybernetics and apply them to sort of liberal uh, purposes, of course. I mean, any tool can be used for, for multiple purposes. Uh, so, um, yeah, I don't know. I've, I mean, it may give them an advantage on their project, but with respect to these questions, I have no idea. I mean, the principles are so general that any viable, the argument from Wiener was precisely any viable system in the world applies these principles somehow of feedback and steering. So it's so general. Mm. He, he, like, uh, Beer uses the human body as an example of a viable system which steers itself, uh, it tries to mis maintain home homeostasis. So that's kind of the, I guess, yeah, homeostasis may be one. A uh, good way to look at it. Uh, the system needs to be able to reproduce itself. Oh, yeah, that ties back to Marx. Social reproduction. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Well, we're. Uh, yes? Thanks, Mia. That's all for us.